My rentals are equally split between Airbnb and VRBO, first of all. Um, it used to be that Airbnb was far ahead of VRBO because Airbnb had started in the urban market. VRBO historically has been vacation rentals in, um, in places like the mountains and the beaches and ski resorts. Um, the two are merging towards each other in terms of where their properties are located. So um, as of 2021, ever since 2021, my bookings on the two are almost equal. Um, each account for 25%. Um, another um, just topic that came up was renters trashing a place. Um, so I do want to just touch on that. You have to be um, careful, um, or at least your property manager needs to be careful about vetting people, knowing what the red flags are, and canceling or stopping a rental before it happens. There's a lot of <clears throat> different red flags that we are attuned to and know which rentals we're going to accept, which ones are go we're going to decline, um, length of stay, when people can rent. There are a lot of different factors that we measure that to make sure that our properties are well taken care of and we don't get trashed. Um, thankfully, we are in a market where that rarely happens because people don't come to Washington, D.C. to party. They were very <laughs> fortunate. People come here for our rich culture and history for the most part. Um, Next, I just again want to touch on now the, the pandemic. Um, we had about 46 properties at the beginning of the pandemic, um, and it's interesting to see, to see how that impacted us. Um, I lost, <coughs> out of those 46, <coughs> excuse me, I lost 16, um, and they were all my one bedrooms and my multi-unit properties because nobody was renting multi-unit properties. Nobody wanted a shared stairway or lobby with anybody and singles weren't traveling. What really <clears throat> saved our bacon here in Washington, D.C. was the, um, the State Department, the Foreign Service, was brought back into the city. Anyone that was non-essential in an embassy was brought back to Washington and were told they had to remain in Washington. So all of my homes filled up. Um, so even though, thank you so much, even though I lost 16 properties, which is about 25% of um, the properties under management, we were only down 12% in 2020. Um, and then 2021, 2022 um, are way over um, 2019. So the business has come roaring back. Um, wow. And I can touch on that as well, what is driving this change. Um, now I want to get to, I think, a topic that everyone should really know about um, or needs to know about, and that is the recently passed um, restrictions on short-term rentals in Washington. Um, they, and I shouldn't say passed, the legislation was passed in October 2018. It was enforced June 9th of this year. Mm -hmm. So um, there are now, DCRA has two licenses in Washington for short-term rental. There's a short-term rental license and there's a vacation rental license. Mm -hmm. The common denominator between the two of those is that it has to be an owner-occupied primary residence. Mm -hmm. And I'm laughing, I'm looking down the table here. I think you brought the women to here so that we I can know. talk about <laughs> what you cannot do. <laughs> so it has to be an owner-occupied primary residence in order for you to rent out short term. Mm -hmm. If you do not live on the property, you cannot rent for under a month. So under a month. Under a month. Under you a month. have to be thirty one when in fact it's thirty one nights. So they pick the uh, longest so definition of a month. It can't be twenty eight, <laughs> it can't be thirty, it has to be thirty one nights. Um, so your stay must can be you, thirty one nights. Can you give over. can you give someone two nights free? To take their twenty nine yes. to thirty one? Yes. Uh -huh. So I do, I mean, all the time. Someone's trying to book for 28 and 8 uh -huh. nights really? and say, I'm just going to take you to 31. Yeah. Um, Use it or don't. Because Whatever we need that. Do. Right. Yeah. Um, and the, um, I kind of lost my train of thought. But on the, um, so it has to be owner-occupied primary residence, and it has to be in an individual's name. It cannot be in an LLC. That's terrible. Oh. So it can be in a trust, <laughs> but yes, you cannot have it in an LLC. But it can be in a trust. It can be in a trust. Is there a specific yes. amount with the vacation? No, we can be in a trust, but you haven't seen the trust. Yes, so I'll get to that. Um, so again, there's two different licenses. And the difference between the two licenses is just short-term rental, the owner is present. 
and vacation rental the owner is absent. So what that means is that if I own a home and I, um, I own you know, a big four bedroom home and I go spend my summers in Nantucket, you can have a property manager leasing out for the summer for you while you're in Nantucket. And they can take short term rentals for up to 90 nights. And those 90 nights do not have to be consecutive. Maybe you take a month in the summer and a month in the, rent, uh, in the winter. Um, you can rent short-term rental. You can do short-term rentals for both those months. So in the, within the calendar year, you can do 90 nights cumulative Maximum. of short-term rentals. This is if it's your primary residence. If you, your if you vacate vacation. your primary <laughs> residence. I have a question about the primary residence aspect. Because yes. there's all sorts of ways that one might indicate what their primary is. What's the, the minimum way to do it? The way that's the yes. least onerous or most flexible? So they want the homestead. It has to be, um, your house has to be, now someone can tell me the exact. It has to have the homestead deduction homestead on it. Deduction. You can, anybody can look on the OTR website, Office of Tax and Revenue, to see if a home has the homestead deduction on it. Um, these are only individuals can qualify for homestead deduction. You, it has to be your primary residence. If you own multiple properties in DC, you can only have one home that has the homestead. Um, and there, there are people who cannot qualify for it. These are generally persons who aren't U.S. taxpayers, for example. Uh, the idea with a homesteader is that you are paying D.C. taxes. So in, in my business, and again, I'm a settlement attorney, um, we don't file homestead applications for you anymore, but we certainly tell you how to do it because you have to go online. Um, so part of my paperwork is, hey, do this. And there's a number of things you have to attest to in order to qualify for the homestead with the Office of Tax and Revenue. So it's very easy to check whether somebody is, uh, qualifies for the homestead because you can see it on the Tax and Revenue website. Right. Just to interject, it was took me like a minute to, because we do Airbnb in our basement and uh, we just needed to send our, our taxes and to sh or that we paid our property taxes and uh, they approved it right away. Yeah. So, so how do you do it? Yeah, so you need um, the clean hands. The clean so DCRA, in order to get the license, you need to um, provide and upload the clean hands certificate and this homestead um, that you get from OTR. And uh, you need to show proof of um, liability insurance. Mm. Uh, so I think those are the three documents you need to upload. But you can go to DCRA, their website, and short-term rentals, and find out. And whether you are, um, whether you qualify for the short-term rental license or the VR license, those qualifications are the same for both. And a, a single building um, can qualify and obtain both licenses. So if you have a basement apartment and you're in the main house. Um, you can get the short-term rental license for the basement apartment, and then when you go spend your summers in Medellin, um, you can get the vacation rental license for your main house, and you can continue to rent both yeah, on a short-term rental basis. I have a question about rules and money. So the way I used to think of Airbnb, say, I don't know, three or five years ago, based on what I was hearing from my friends, being only a traditional landlord with 12-month leases, um, was that, you know, it's about two times as much money uh, revenue. And now I know there's more expenses and work, I get that, but just top line revenue was about double. But, but I'm hearing sort of three categories, your traditional 12 month, maybe your short stay, which could be as short as one night or three nights or whatever, and then these like the 31, yeah. 31 yeah. midterms, which yeah. kind of, and what I want to know is like, how does the, the gross revenue compare as you go from, you know, most, uh, Restrictive, say the twelve-month lease, to sort of a little bit, you know, the midterm as you're calling it, and the short. Do you have a, in your minds, do you have a? Ooh, that's kind of. What um, that is? If it would um, be a thousand, then would it be two, and then three? How does it work? So that's a little um, off the top of my head. Um, like I can have, a, I've had studio apartments where um, I've done seven thousand a month mm -hmm. for a studio. Um, but is that going to be only <laughs> and then, yeah, really and so the land, space, right? yeah, so my client, my client got paid over 5000 for the wow. studio. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, on the regular rental market, that probably would have been 
2,000, mm -hmm. 2,500. Wow. And what about the 31 days? So the 31 days would probably be um, for furnished, um, probably 3,000. Um, and maybe she'd make, you know, 17, 1,800. Uh, but, but the uh, gross number is something like 237, 236. Um, Yes. Something like that. Yeah. Okay. Shorter, and of course, very you know, it all depends on like, location. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, you know, the opportunity now is that with the implementation, and I, I'm going to come back to, actually, let me continue on the rules. Okay. Um, and then I'll talk about how this has changed the whole landscape. Um, so the regulations. There is another um, variation, and it's on the vacation rental license. If you are... Um, if you're deployed somewhere for work or with the government, for example, um, you're with um, the State Department, you own a home here, and you've just been assigned to Romania for three years, you can rent your house short term. Um, you'll get the vacation rental license with an exemption. So, they, so those properties I can rent short term all year long for three years. Um, and the other exemption is if you are leaving the area to take care of somebody like an elderly aunt or um, a, a disabled sibling. Um, the same thing, you can, um, you can get an exemption and then rent out short term the whole time you're gone. And um, someone recently asked me um, why I thought that was the case and it's so that these people can come back to their primary residence. Uh, I, if you don't mind if I interrupt, I think the idea being, because I was part of, um, I listened to the council debate about this. <laughs> the idea being there has been so much backlash in the city because of TOPA, the Tenant Opportunity to Purchase Act, that you don't want to have persons, you don't, you don't want to distress the citizens in, in, in D.C. who are paying taxes if you need to have these types of exemptions. They need to be able to come back to the property if they have to come back to the property. Um, you don't want to be put in a situation where they can't even come back into their own home because somebody is acting like a tenant. So there are exemptions where you can get a, a vacation, um, uh, short-term rental for you know elder uh, uh, taking care of persons being deployed that sort of thing. Yeah. Exactly. So I have a lot of clients in that situation as well. Um, so that raises a question we talked about today. Since you brought it up, does a short-term tenant qualify for tenant rates? Do they if need it's a bill 90, of rights? If it's under 91 nights and they're itinerant, do they have the same rights as a tenant? I will say this this probably remains to be seen. This is sort of a, a brand new space. Oh, oh no, gosh, come on. Um, <laughs> Listen, it all, it, 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 it's never a problem until it's a problem, right? So if somebody is remaining there, the, the question is, um, how do you get them out if they're staying there? Are they gonna qualify for tenant rights? And I, to my knowledge, we don't have case law on this yet because the short-term rental space, while the law was passed in 2018, it was supposed to start in October 2019, but didn't actually start getting enforced and, issued, and licenses being issued until this year. We don't really have good legal um, uh, guidance on what happens if somebody overstays their welcome and then tries to assert tenant rights. Uh, for those of you in this room who don't know, I think all of you probably do, DC is one of the most tenant-friendly jurisdictions in the country. Uh, and there are, um, you know, the, the, tenants are able to successfully assert, or persons living in a home, I should say, are uh, very easily um, tr and traditionally able to assert tenant rights in the city. Yeah. So it's something you do need to look out for. I mean, it's not just trashing the properties. It's yeah. also, gosh, what am I going to do if they overstay their welcome to? I think uh, uh, another question I want, and apologies for interjecting, to raise is also something I came across building my company has been uh, rent control properties. Right. And mm -hmm. when you pursue something like the lease arbitrage model, which is what my company is doing, you really have to take into consideration the laws, not just around typical leasing, but subletting. Mm -hmm. And the only case law that covers rent control on property that's being sublet is Slaby v. the DC Housing Administration from the mid 90s, which talks about how um, the tenant really took her landlord, somebody subletting to her for multiple bedrooms, to court mm -hmm. over the fact that she was making more money off of that sublet <laughs> than what she was paying the landlord. And they 
basically found that she had to return all of the net proceeds that she had made from that lease in spite of the fact that she um, was paying for utilities, you know, and wasn't including that in the charges. So that was actually a really interesting piece of case law that exists, but there's been nothing to come out on that since that decision other than, I guess, really people just staying away from, from rent control, which also there's the, of course, you know, you can't have more than four uh, properties in leases. your name, four leases in your name as an individual, otherwise you're no longer exempt it's from rent control. But units. these are things I'd love to hear your thoughts on. Um, I, I, all I will say is that uh, it, it just takes one person to find this case law, and there hasn't been anything since then right. on that. Um, there, and, and I think that's why you guys gather here. How can we monetize this market? Um, but then one of you is going to have a bad experience and that can, that can turn you off to the whole process. And I would say in general in DC, especially with property tax rates as low as they are, um, and homes as desirable as they are, there's always going to be, uh, there's always going to be, um, uh, a way to, to, um, to monetize this, right? But you have to be cognizant of the fact that something could go wrong. And I think our court system in DC is, is very tenant friendly um, and is sympathetic for the most part to tenants. This may be being one of the exceptions where a landlord was able to say, oh, you can't do that. I mean, with mortgages to bring Ed into this conversation, uh, banks do the same thing, right? They say, listen, if you're gonna collect money from this and not pay your mortgage, we'll go after you for the money you've been collecting in rent or, or I'm not using the right terminology and I apologize because I'm an attorney with, um, uh, uh, who, who, thinks about, who thinks about ownership of property, but collecting a money in a short-term rental as well. So you have to be careful in, in that respect. Um, but a lot of this is unsettled and uh, it will, it, it will take um, advocates from our community uh, on both sides to challenge these issues. So you're gonna have um, advocates who are working on behalf of uh, the community where there is, you know, there's no affordable housing in DC, for example, to set that spark to say, hey, we need to crack down on the rent control issue, people who are subverting that, people are subverting this, the short-term rental, but it'll also take the advocates of, of owners and landlords in DC. If we own a property here and we're making our tax payments, why should we be limited in what we do with our own property? So there's gonna be a push and pull on that, which is frankly why this law has, has taken so long to come to, come to fruition as well. Yeah. And Just, oh. Sorry. To shift it to last, and then we could go a free for all. Ed, mm -hmm. I want you to talk about what the is going on with the Fed, <laughs> and is is it an inflection point? You know. So, yeah, absolutely. So we are definitely in a unique time uh, in our history as far as rates are concerned. Uh, we've seen rates increase quite a bit from uh, 2021. So, for example, the average mortgage rate back in 2021 was 2.96%, uh, which is you know, kind of ridiculous with a 30 year fix, really, really low rate. Fast forward to right now, uh, rates are between six and a half and 7% on a 30 year fix uh, type of mortgage. So we've seen a significant increase in the rates. Uh, factors on this would be the uh, mortgage bonds and securities, uh, inflation, um, as well as uh, unemployment. Uh, all of those percentages have gone up and it has uh, indirect uh, reflection and impact on the mortgage rates. So that's kind of where we are right now, unfortunately. Now, because of that, it does not mean that we have to stop entertaining purchasing and doing business in the real estate market. Uh, right now, uh, Prime is at 7%. Um, as of March of this year, Prime was at 3.5%, so it's doubled in you know, a little bit less than eight months. So it's kind of a shock. But what people don't realize is, Times like this open up opportunities for people that want to purchase property. So it is, it is not a bad time to buy. Uh, this Thank is you, so. <laughs> <laughs> a good time to buy, guys. Forever a good time. Forever a good time. Yes. So um, from, from, from the real estate community, from the realtors, we've been 
you know, talking about potential foreclosures, you know, coming being like flooding the market um, at the top of. So, so no, to answer your question, no. Um, this is not the same as 2007, 2008 for the housing crisis. Um, reason being that um, we are experiencing rate increases. But back in 2007, 2008, it was more than rate increases. As a matter of fact, the rates really didn't increase that much at all. Um, the problem was there was a lot of exotic mortgages out there. Um, you know, mainly things like stated income, where we get people, basically we're just giving money away for people. Anybody and everybody can get approved. So we weren't looking for bank statements, we weren't looking for uh, W-2s or tax returns. Um, buyer's and, loans. Yeah, yeah, buyer's loans. You can have a credit score of 520, um, and we can still get you a house, which was great for buyers, but we didn't see, or you know, the Fed, the banks didn't see the long-term ramifications for something like that. Um, they didn't take into account the emotional impact uh, with buying a house. So, you know, we're not looking at income, we're not looking at assets, we're expecting everybody to be, to be adults as far as the borrower is concerned, to know how much they can afford, right? So, unfortunately, you go look at a house, and all you see is a beautiful backyard. Uh -huh. You see, oh, this basement, this could be my man cave, like this is gonna be awesome. Um, you see the, the great kitchen that you wanted. And you start to convince yourself that you can afford a house that maybe that you couldn't. And the bank is telling you that you can approve, so I'm gonna go ahead and do it. So. That happened nationwide, and the problem was people would convince themselves, I'm gonna get a, a raise for my job, I'm going to do the side venture, make some money, and six months into the mortgage, those things didn't happen. But guess what, the mortgage payments were still due. So we had a you know, huge um, increase in foreclosures at an alarming rate, which you know, basically got us into the housing bubble that we stayed in for a couple years. Yeah. Um, so right now, um, we had since 2012, rates have been phenomenally low. Like, we've really got spoiled big time. Rates were around 3.6% 2012, stayed that way, and like I said, 2021, they were down at 2.96, and um, beginning of 2022, they were around the same, they just recently started to go back up. So I say it to say that people have mortgages that they, they can afford. The rates are there, the banks totally went far right with um, instead of having a stated income, we wanted everything but your firstborn as far as getting you qualified. So the people that got their mortgages, they definitely qualified. We looked at your income up and down, we scrubbed it back and forth, and we know for a fact that you can afford that payment. And so, so COVID didn't have an effect on people being able to afford their mortgage. Like we, sh we shouldn't be optimistic about um, expecting any, any inventory, like a, a flood of inventory in the market. Like COVID didn't even have an impact. I'm not going to say that you shouldn't expect anything, but as far as the volume, we're not going to see anything close to what 2007, 2008. People, you know, people are going to have problems. People lose their jobs. Things happen in life. Life kicks in, but um, it's not going to be anything like it was in 2007, 2008. As far as what I can see right now. Also, Nick, like I've always said that um, we're very well insulated because you, yeah. you got to have a job to buy a house these days, anyhow. Right? Yeah, not, not, yeah, back then. not back then. <laughs> yeah. um, and you know, the, the job market is um, so healthy. And you know the, the levels of compensation are also getting better, right? But just just uh, employment at all is so so steady. Um, one of the reasons that we realtors want rates to drop is so so we can buy because we're investors. Yeah. But of course, the, the main reason I'm is sorry, realtors is, is you get in front of here, so you're trying to take. Well, uh, okay. <laughs> I'm not trying to make a speech, but the main, the main reason, the main, the main reason, the main reason it is that we want to sell houses. Mm -hmm. Now I'm starting to have another concern, which is if rates don't drop, we won't be able to get existing homeowners out there as sellers. Yeah. And we're getting some lock up there because people are yeah. loving their rate and maybe thinking again about whether to buy. What do you What do you see in terms of where rates are headed and by when? Yeah, Sorry, so, I put you on the spot. Yeah, so you, you definitely put me on the spot. Yeah, yeah, um, we don't really know. Um, you know, uh, 2007, 2008 lasted for like three, four years. Um, so worst case scenario, maybe that. Um, we have seen some movement going back as far as the rates go, getting a little bit lower. Last week they were um, like 6.750, went down by an eighth. So it's not a big, you know, you know, you don't want to pop a champagne and get too excited about it, but it is movement in the right direction. Well, then so. let me ask you this: If you don't want to act like you have a crystal ball, mm -hmm. will you critique somebody else's? So, so um, the Mortgage Bankers Association, I don't believe it was last week, but the week before, mm -hmm. literally said that the, that the conforming uh, loan is gonna be down to 5.4% 30-year fixed by September of next year. 
Yeah. They, they said that. It was like a number and a date. I was like, wow, that's, yeah. I, I hope that's true. But what do you think about that? Does that sound overly optimistic or? I think it's, it's optimistic, but um, I'm hoping they're accurate. You know, for selfish reasons. Sure. You know, I want the race to go back down just like everybody else. Um, but we were with historic lows, so I'm not sure if they're ever going to get back down to 3%. Crossing our fingers, saying, Hail Mary, whatever you're going to do. We hope so, but we're not sure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I have a quick question for the lovely lady right there. I'm sorry, I lost your name. Charlotte. Charlotte. So <laughs> for Airbnb. So the only way to make money at this. Uh, short-term rental thing. It's not to be an owner, it's actually to be an operator like you. The owners are making money too. The yeah, but my point is, like, if I have seven condos, I cannot put them because they're not going to be my name. If I sell them condos for, for, for leasing short-term, I mean, I can't do that. You can do the midterm. So um, one of the things I wanted to talk about was this growing kind of middle length of stay mm -hmm. um, from one month to say six, seven, eight months. Um, and that, that particular sector of the market is the fastest growing. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at air DNA, it's growing at 22%. Mm -hmm. um, and so what is driving this? A lot of this came about as a result of the pandemic. Um, the technology has now been put in place where we can work remotely. Um, people have stepped back and, um, like my colleague here, mm -hmm. and thought, how do I really want to spend my life? Mm -hmm. um, you know, I want to be, I want to be more footloose. I want to go, I want to be in, um, I want to be in London for a month or two. I want to try living in San Francisco for several months, you know. So people are, have changed the way they live. They've changed their values. Technology has changed. And so that is driving the stay, um, the stays that are longer than a month. Mm. So from kind of a visitor standpoint, that market is growing rapidly, not just in Washington, but all over the world. Mm. Um, unique to Washington, we have again, um, the State Department where all that personnel comes back into Washington, they get retraining, retraining, and then they go to another embassy. So they're coming in for like, could be one month, nine months, um, we also have, um, like, uh, same goes with the World Bank, the IMF. They're coming in for several months at a time. The embassies have people coming in. We have a, a real density of universities. So um, we have the summer interns, and um, that's a very robust market as well. Um, we also have just kind of regular turnover of people that are coming in to work for the government. Um, and we'll get that, um, thankfully, less so than um, uh, was threatened with the midterms. Um, but we'll get new people coming into Washington, um, and they need a place to rent while they look for a place to buy. Mm -hmm. um, so there's all these other situations. Oh, people are coming in, um, uh, medical treatment. Um, there are the people who like to retire in Washington, D.C., those that are real, really love culture, so they are coming in and renting short term while they look for a place to buy, kind of the try before you buy. Um, so it's a really long list of people that are filling short term rentals. So what I had um, effective June 9th is that 75% of my properties um, were um, no longer available to short term rent. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I needed to have a month stay or longer in them. That was June 8th. July was my highest grossing month ever. Really? Wow. Yes. Wow. So people were like, oh, Charlie, you know, your business is going to collapse. And I'm like, no, not at all. Not at all. There is, you know, there is this, um, again, this trend that is happening that was only accelerated with the pandemic. Which is hugely liberating for uh, we who want to be investors, yes. but not on rock. Right, and you look, you look at um, Airbnb and VRBO, and both of them have made changes to make it easier to book stays of over a month. Um, and I get plenty of rentals for stays over a month on, um, on those two websites. Um, and 50% are word of mouth, and they're coming from a lot of real estate agents. For my stays. That's because, hard just referring everybody. Yeah. That's where you're talking about. <laughs> because my, yeah, like my client's house just sold this week, and oh my gosh, they've got to move out. Charlotte, you have a, a furnished place while well, yeah. you're looking for another place to buy. Or mm -hmm. these people are coming in, like my brother and sister in law, they want to move to Washington, D.C. in their retirement, and um, they need a place to stay while they're looking. Mm -hmm. So we have all sorts of those. Sorry. Mm -hmm. I have a quick one. 
Let's go. Yeah, open it up for questions. Thanks, guys. I have a question, I have a question for everybody, but specifically you. Okay. Um, so Southern Spain, mm -hmm. that's where your property is. Um, I've heard Southern Spain, Costa del Sol, mm -hmm. a really good place to invest. Okay. Part of the reason I've, I've heard that is because people are buying in Southern Spain um, or in Gibraltar and, and living in Spain. So it's the Euro, it's the Euro pound thing where they're making money off the pound, but they're living in the Euro. They're, they're paying a mortgage on the Euro, but mm -hmm. kind of that. Right. Um, is that something to... <clears throat> Well, it's, it's interesting, you know, since the war in Ukraine started, the, uh, the euro to dollar rate came down almost 20%. So it's near parity, it goes up and down, I've been watching it carefully, so that is definitely one consideration. The other one is affordability. Um, so I, I've traveled, I have friends who have a, a bought a house there to retire, um, they're a little older than I am. Um, but it is, the cost of living is low, the quality of living is high. Um, it is a very popular area for Northern Europeans. So even though it's Spain, English is spoken pretty easily and pretty state widely. Of Germany. I'm sorry. It's the 17th state of Germany, right? Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> no, but I mean, it, it's, it's really something. I mean, I, I traveled a little bit down the coast a little bit to a different, um, to a different town. And it was like all, you know, all the little neighborhoods in Manhattan with little Italy and little, you know, Russia or whatever, it was like, oh, this must be the Scandinavian part because you just see all these signs and sure. the different Scandinavian languages. And so it, it's, it's definitely a service-oriented part of the town. Like, for me to find an attorney who speaks English and Spanish is, was very easy. Uh, you can go online and say, okay, I, I need to put in air conditioning. But then there's three or four companies right there in the vicinity who have websites in English to help you install air conditioning. So is that, is that so, so, so you could, I don't know, there's another, let's say there's another very uh, close uh, English speaking area, you know, near something that's totally the opposite, right? Um, I, I look at Southern Spain as being very touristy. Gibraltar yes. is fully English. Um, is that yes. something that you would consider being, you know, in an area where even if the real estate, even if the investment purposes are, are so, uh, you know, exciting that, um, you, know, you really don't have that person to communicate with. If, you, if you're somewhere where it's maybe less exciting, um, but you're able to really work on it to make less money. Yes, because I'm a poly. I mean, I speak multiple languages, so okay. I love trying to do things in foreign languages. But um, also, I just I lived for 10 years in Europe, so I definitely see myself retiring there. So oh. for this, okay. it's very right. natural okay. that I kind of get my toe hold in oh. Europe. And what I really like about it is it's on the Euro, it's in Europe, but it's a very low cost area of Europe. And it's beautiful, <laughs> it's right on the Mediterranean Sea. You know, So there's just a lot of benefits and it's the reason why it's attracting a lot of retirees. Scott, I have a follow up question to that is, is um, so obviously we have Airbnb, VRBO, a lot of platforms out there for marketing a home that you have for any duration of stay, but actually sourcing quality properties over in Europe, I understand Things like Zillow, CoStar Group, obviously, which runs apartments.com. I mean, they provide most of the data for the institutional real estate firms, like the one I worked at in New York. That doesn't necessarily exist, and that data fluidity and tra transparency in the real estate markets do doesn't exist. So how do you find these properties? Um, what, what's the best way to do it? Is it local classifieds? or? Uh, no, so they do have online listings. Okay. Um, I would say this, I was joking with my friends, so the role of a real estate agent in Spain, or at least in that part of Spain, is very different than here. I would say half of your job in America is shifted over to the settlement attorney. So all of the responsibility for the transaction and ushering the, the client through the transaction is done by a notary or an attorney there. Um, and I think I looked at ads last weekend for 20 different properties. The photos were absolutely horrendous. <laughs> it was like I went back to marketing in the U.S. 15 years ago. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they were like dark, <laughs> terrible cell phone photos, no wide angle. I can't even tell what the layout <laughs> is of the property. And it's almost like I'm not even going to bother looking at this because if I can find somebody who's marketing appropriately, then they deserve my business, right? So it's just... It, it was also one of those things. Um, so, s 
So they list it, but they kind of list it and it's just kind of out there and, oh, if somebody comes, somebody comes and, oh, you want to tour it, okay, well. I mean, there's no hustle. And what are they listing it on? Is it like a local Spanish listing website or is it like? Uh, they have their own websites, yeah. So the one I'm looking at is called Idol Lista. Okay. Ideal, I-S-T-A. Idealista. Okay. Idealista. Cool. Yes. That's a cool name. That is a cool name. Yes. Um, so, I have a question for you. So that's a consolidator for multiple brokerages who list their, their, uh, their properties. Charlotte, sure. I had a question for you. I've got an Airbnb that we're running out of our basement in Virginia. Okay. It's been one year. It's been great all midterm. But I was wondering if you do anything like um, getting guests to sign a lease through VRBO or Airbnb or outside to protect yourself? Hmm. Um, I, I'm not routinely. Um, if I have a rental that's 91 nights or longer, because they're not a tenement in Washington, D.C., I do have them sign the G-Car lease. Yeah. I have a question. Oh, I'm sorry, were you? Well, it's for you and then for the other Airbnb hosts. Um, I have a couple of Airbnbs in, uh, outside of Charlottesville, and um, a problem I'm running into is just minimum price. So I use dynamic pricing, you know, minimum base, maximum price, and I don't know what my minimum price should be where I should just leave it empty. Obviously, I want to turn a profit on my, I just got them, so I'm, I want to like buy reviews too, where maybe it's a little bit lower so I can get some review basis, but in your experience, you know, at what uh, price point does it make sense to have it empty, and then at what price point you want to say, okay, well, I want to make at least you know X amount of dollars, you know, per, per night. Well, that is, um, I guess, that's something that we're all um, uh, dealing with on a regular basis. Because if you drop it too low, then you might get someone in who's not going to respect your property. Um, and um, <laughs> so we, we rent the cheap. There are so many factors, whether you're on site or you're off site or you're doing this remotely. But, um, you know, and you can do the Airbnb model where they do, they give you the price, they give you the price suggestions. I find, um, you know, my properties, I'm Lux B and B, so my properties are better than um, the competitors. Um, you know, for my type of property. So I can't depend on that. I use instead a, a different um, kind of pricing software, and what it does, it looks at all Airbnb. I, I use Airbnb. Price Labs. I don't know. Okay. You then do. you have something similar. Yeah, okay. I use Beyond Pricing. Okay. Yeah, okay. similar. Yeah. So, um, so I use that, and uh, you know, you really need to make that determination. Mm -hmm. um, and again, you know, are you there to greet the people if you're there to greet them? Like, I'm two hours away, so it's definitely a more of a remote sort of scenario. Yeah, and then, you know, again, at what, what price point? Are you floating between five to 700 a night because it's a night house? One's, house? Yeah, one's a little, one's a tiny house and the, the other's a cottage. So one of them goes for like 120 a night and then, you know, 150 on the weekends and then the other goes for like 175 up to 300 on the weekends. So obviously I don't, like literally the budget in is like, almost my competition for the little house on the off season. So like, I don't want great strategy to share with me, um, where you max, maximize the space on your weekends. Yeah. So because you know, you're going to make money there first. So you're going to make, um, the, your minimum stay the longest, depending on your strategy. Mm -hmm. So you, you book it as seven, Day minimum. Yeah. You fill up all the biggest slots, and then you do you short short it down. But right. it was a right. Well, so a more well thought out strategy. Right. Than, right. Than so technically, there there is this uh, there is this strategy that they you know most of the people that talk about it will like push for longer terms. Mm -hmm. You know, push for like four days or five days or a week. Right. Mm -hmm. And try that one for a couple months. But it all depends if you have a luxury of a time. You know, you can you, you were able, you're going to be able to pay for your mortgage or all of those things, but um, in all of the research that I did, so there are two different strategies. One push for seven days, and then um, whatever days that they're kind of like empty. After two or three months, try to advertise and push for the other, you know, days. That usually like Friday, Saturday, and Sunday for my property. Thursday, Friday, and Saturday it goes like this. 
The only issue that I had for the, for the first like six months was finding a way to, you know, technically um, try to like booking the Mondays to like Wednesday. That was, that was the area that I had issue with. Um, that to be honest with you, thanks to, to COVID, the first couple of months it was kind of like hectic, but after that it got a hundred times better. Mm. Um, just because my house is kind of like big house, you know, it's like eight bedrooms and six bath. Um, but the other strategy at the beginning was, there was just something that I wanted to touch. That um, it was so funny that a couple of years ago I went to American University to one of the business seminars, and one of the person that one of the speakers mentioned something that you know I just wanted to share. Not that something that I believe, but that was interesting. That they were like, um, when it comes to business, especially in sort of like short term, you know, rent haul out and whatever. People have two different mindsets. One is McDonald's, the other one is high-end steak place. That's exactly what they put it. So it all depends. You can drop your rate, but your occupancy is gonna be 100%, or you can just do some research in the neighborhood that your property is, and go exactly the same or a little bit higher. Um, let me give you an example. Um, Last month, I helped a friend of mine. He saw that my platform, you know, just, just working pretty well. Um, he had, he bought a property in Fairfax, but had an apartment in one of those high rises that he got a good deal. So it was like, you know what, help me because I just want to learn, you know, Airbnb. And I was like, absolutely. So I took a picture from, you know, I, he's my friend. Free of charge, I help him. He did set up everything last month. Um, his birthday was at the end of that week that we posted it. Like, let's say we posted it on Monday, and it was like, you know what, for the first 10 days, I really don't want to get any clients, so let's just put the price that nobody, like, uh, it's a two bedroom, so technically the market price for that area is like $250. So I was like, you know what, let's just put 550 the day after. Boom, boom, for four days. And I was like, are you kidding me? So I was like so interested just because I was managing the, you know, all of the email and all of the text. The guy was so nice and he was a super host too. So I was like, you know what? I have to talk to him. <laughs> He's a super host. He knows the business the, the and guest, all of those things. The guest, the, guest the, guest, the guest was a super host from North Carolina. Interesting. So um, <laughs> a friend of mine was like, hey, listen, uh, you know, the first time just because it's a building that they don't have any permission to do the Airbnb, but he has a connection, you know. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. So um, I was like, you know what, I have to talk to him. Like me as a super host, if I want to go to North Carolina, you know, I'll just do some research after five minutes, you know exactly, you know, which neighborhood you have to stay and what's the price that you have to pay. I talked to the guy and he was so interesting. He had that mentality of like, you know what, I knew that the rate is like close to 300, but I just rented it for three days. I just wanted to see there, if there's something exceptional about this property. So some of the people, like in this line of business, that's, that's one of the things that I absolutely love about it. Every day with each um, technically client, sort of a client that you get, you learn something new of the way that people think and the, and the way that people do, do they want to do business. In my property in Cathedral, I, I, I know the fact right now, if I do room by room, let's say in six months or a year, my income is gonna be not exactly double, but it's gonna be more. But I prefer to have my price on 1200, that in that, in that neighborhood usually is like 900, or like $1,000. I prefer to put it on 1200. My occupancy is gonna be 65%, it's not gonna be 80%. Mm. But my income at the, end of the, at the end of the year is gonna be probably the same, but I have more access to my property mm. and the clients that I'm gonna get is gonna be a sort of like better clients. But always, re always remember that if you charge, if the rates for that neighborhood is 900, but you charge them 1200, you have to give them the service of 1200. Yeah. Yeah. You have to, yeah. you know, we have to force them that, hey, listen, this customer service is a different customer service. Mm -hmm. 
Well, so, on a follow-up, um, I was also curious, you know, what sort of uh, customer service, you know, value adds that you provide, like, uh, for instance, like a custom sign that says, you know, welcome Charlotte or welcome Roosevelt, like, uh, are you for, like for me, it's champagne and chocolate, chocolate and, yeah, okay. and a card, like yeah. a welcome card. Yeah, you're welcome back. And uh, you're welcome back. You, yeah, you, yeah, you, you always have to make sure the most important thing is like the first impression is just right. the most important thing. Mm -hmm. So when they enter the property, by the time that they get, my property is like four floors. So the first floor, as soon as they get in, the lighting, the it's frame, like picture frames that you put, Everything has to, you know, be a sort of like, I'm, I'm not saying like overdue, just because this is not the property that you're gonna live. Um, but it has to be the way that, hey, welcome. Mm -hmm. You know, like this is, you know, this, this is your house for the next, you know, 24 hours or for the next four or five days. Logistically, with the gift baskets, is your housekeeper, you know, taking those out of storage and? Yeah, you know, it's part of the turnover. Uh, one building we have a, Utility closet that we store it all in. You just buy gift baskets in bulk or something. Exactly. And if it's a house, then we just have a little lockable storage area. No problem. Do a lot of, uh, I guess, foreign money, like purchase properties in, in Colombia? Or is it yeah, like it's a big way to get a, to get a visa in Colombia is to invest in the country and you can get a visa that way. Um, yeah. I have a couple questions over here. Um, for Ruth Bash, is your property? Is your property um, residential zone, and is it your primary? No, it's not. Okay. Yeah, the license, so this property was a bed and breakfast before. Okay. So um, we, um, we kept that license for the past like seven years. We bought that property about like 10 years ago, and when we bought the property, the property didn't have any kitchen. Mm -hmm. So, um, but the license for that one is kind of like a special license. It's not even a bed and breakfast license. It considered as a rooming license. So that license goes under the category of hotels, technically. Mm -hmm. Is it so, in the R1 zoning? Uh, is it like a residential zoning or something like <coughs> you? No, actually, it's a two, uh, it's, it's, there are three bed and breakfasts in that neighborhood that they're keeping the same license. Nice. And we bought it, like uh, the owner of all three properties was just one. Uh, we were lucky to basically hunt one of them. Yeah, and then you mentioned you have other properties, are those? So I'm, I'm manage, actually I'm managing three more properties, but they are in um, Virginia. Okay. There are condos in Virginia. I just wanted to learn, you know, about this business more. But I'm 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 looking for a property, yeah. um, same style as the Cathedral House that we have, to add into my portfolio. Yeah, because I mean the problem in D.C. and I know I spoke to most people in here, and I know, you know, most of you guys we're not stopping it. We don't want one, right? Right. Most people are here already have one, and we want five or 10, you know, the KWA is big, big, right? So the, the challenge in DC, maybe we have to take our business elsewhere is, you know, how do we, do we mm. look for properties that are zoned that we can use do the bed and breakfast? Because, um, you know, you can't just have more than just one primary. True. Sure. a big challenge. Yeah, very true. So I, I'm curious if anybody has workarounds. I mean, the whole 30 days was, over 30 days was like mind blowing where his model is, you know, rent a place, but as long as it's 30, 30, 30 plus days that you're allowed to do it. So it's, it's a little bit of an in-between. Yeah, but I mean, I think the 30 days is gonna be, you're still gonna be handcuffed, right? I mean, you're still not making that premium short-term cash. To be honest with you, even with 90 days, I think even with that 90 days, that's like brutal. I had a friend who had 10 properties in DC. Um, two of the properties, he was the owner, and he was doing the Airbnb, he was living in one. Um, he was doing the uh, other property as a kind of like Airbnb. He rented eight more properties with the option of subleasing and he was doing Airbnb. I and mean, he was doing fantastically for like two years before that all of those like new rules and regulations hit the market. Mm -hmm. He lost eight of them. Mm -hmm. wow. He had a great relationship with the landlord, but they were not able to technically get the license. So one thing that you guys have to remember, the, um, so I went to the seminars, I'm, I'm pretty sure that you went to those seminars too, uh, for the Airbnb. So Airbnb asked all of the people that they were doing Airbnb, you know, sort of like Airbnb, uh, to go to a seminar. Um, one of the numbers that they announced, um, I think it was a month and a half or two months ago, 
that 24% of the people that they were the owner of properties and they were doing Airbnb, they were not able to get a license or they were not interested to get the short-term license. Mm -hmm. So that's good for, you know, if you want to start that business, Airbnb business in DC, that's fantastic. 24% of the people that they were supposed to be your competitors are not in the market anymore. But it's still, you're dealing with that 30 days, 90 days on all of those like yeah. rules and shebangs around it. There was a question from the audience. Um, uh, from <laughs> what? I can sit here all night. I'm gonna go work out. Oh, oh, go work out. Go, oh okay, Brian first. No, 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 then, no. I'm, I'm and just then, joking. Go ahead. Yeah. My question one, one, two, and then Mona, and then oh, actually, just just this one real go quick because you're really strong. <laughs> is uh, from from the audience? Is a short term rental license needed in Maryland too, or is it general? How does one apply for one? Details, please. Yeah. So talking about Maryland. Is it different? They do have restrictions. I'm not, I, I don't know them because I operate in D.C. Too bad. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, county, it's county by county. Right. So yeah. Montgomery County does have a short-term rental um, licensing. Uh, but off the top of my head, I also don't know it. Um, <laughs> if you go a little further out, and it's not, uh, it's not based on principal residence. You just have to get the license. So if you go a little further out, the rules are less strict. Montgomery County is, um, as is, is there more. Austin Hill. Uh, I, I, I don't know off the top of my head with PG County. I apologize. Yeah. yeah. Shoot me an email. I'm happy to look it up. All right. Muscles over here. All right. I've got about 20 questions, so I'm only going to hit you all with a couple. I'll talk to you afterwards, right, because we'll be here all night. Uh, so I recently purchased a three-unit row home using Carlos and the great team here on Fairmont Street up in Northwest. Right now, I live there, primary residence, check that box, got all the short-term vacation rental licensing, went through that whole terrible process uh, with DC, as we all know. So right now, I'm short-term renting a on Airbnb and VRBO a three-bedroom that's grossing about 9,500 to 10,500 a month, just on a three-bedroom. Uh, just got in the game, but I'm, my first question is for all my medium-term rental people here, I have no long-term plans to live in DC. So when I move out, I have a fully furnished luxury rental. Uh, it's three bedrooms. What's the market demand for a three bedroom vice a one bedroom studio or two bedroom in the medium term market? I, is, there, is there more demand for a one bedroom, AKA traveling nurse, nurses, traveling, you know, like that user persona, right? For who you think about your audiences for that medium term rental. Because I just got back from the Bigger Pockets conference out in San Diego. Shout out, amazing event, everyone should yeah. go. And they had a bunch of medium term rental experts on there, and everyone unanimously agreed in the room. Granted, I don't think there were a lot of people from DC, but everyone unanimously agreed that the medium term rental strategy was best for studios, ones, and two bedrooms. So, curious to hear your thoughts on that. Huh. Yeah, I have, uh, my quick response is absolutely, but it really depends on the type of model you're trying to rent through. So for my company, for example, it's really like co-living base. So people love the idea of booking out an individual bedroom. It's also a little more affordable. So it's like um, hostel type? Pretty much, okay. yeah. And that's, a, that's a good analogy. Nice, nice hostel. I'm not, yeah. I'm not downplaying. <laughs> no, no, not at all. Yeah. But um, <laughs> if you do go with studios, one bedrooms, you will wind up dealing more so with like tra the traveling nurse type or people maybe um, in the military. A lot of people also who receive stipends to compensate them for traveling for work and paying for housing, they're definitely looking for studios, one bedroom, one bath type deal. But I'd love to hear. Yeah, and Charlotte, I think you mentioned stuff. you had a couple four bedrooms, if I, if I heard that correctly. So I'm curious um, to hear your response. Yeah, so um, and certainly over the almost 12 years I've been in business, we've been in all these markets and we've been into all these people, you know, the nurses, the students, the families. Um, and again, I have five bedroom homes. I have, um, I don't really even have any studios anymore. I have one bedrooms. Um, and there's really, uh, there's not less demand for a house in the midterm. That's all the families. So think about, um, you know, all the people that are relocating. Or um, uh, another, um, another is insurance stays. I have a lot of those. Um, and they're incredibly profitable. Um, you know, the, um, the price is based on the value of the home that they had to vacate, how much the insurance company will pay. Um, so we get some crazy monthly rates for insurance stays. 
um, and all the um, the families with the World Bank that are cycling through. I just, you know, I'm just kind of churning through all the people I have now for midterm stays. I have German journalists and their families. Um, I have World Bank. I have IMF. I have uh, people that are. Um, I have a couple of insurance stays. I have people that are renovating their house. I have people looking to purchase in Washington D.C. Um, so my houses are full. So I'm pretty much back-to-back -back rentals. Wow, that's you awesome. Say my, yeah, that one quick follow-on to that is for the medieval term rental crew, right? Obviously, we have Airbnb, VRBO. I think you mentioned you're on Booking.com as well. What about furnished finders? Is it Facebook? What are your strategies you're seeing predominantly work? Because my, my main question here is on Airbnb recently, or not that recently, raising their prices. So if you say, hey, you know, instead of getting, uh, we'll take a one bedroom, this would normally rent long term at 2400 It could probably rent medium term at 3200 and it could probably rent short term at 4800 right? One, one and a half, two X. Um, but on Airbnb, if that guest is booking, they're paying a surcharge now of 15%, and then the host is losing, what, 3 4%? 3, 3, 3, 3. And, and so those fees have to weigh in. You know, what was already a little bit elevated for a one bedroom is now really, you know, a lot more for the, for the end consumer. So I'm just curious what other platforms, if I could dial that question. I'd be happy to start off and say that Airbnb has been great for driving leads, and it seems that um, we do not push them to do this, but 90% of those people wind up disintermediating Airbnb because of that charge and book directly through our website. Mm -hmm. Because we are, we kind of just have the brand image there on the, the platform and they see the name and then just Google it and figure out, okay, they're a company. And so you can't book like there. Cortado, uh, dot com, but you could put the draw. No, yeah, yeah, just literally yeah. like the name is Cortado, add a little blurb about us in mm -hmm. the, you know, about this property, about the host section. And people do not like, they do not like paying $900 to $1,000 for, you know, a four month stay. Um, and then I think most of our demand though, we drive bookings through like B2B relationships. So okay. that's it's really like word of mouth at this stage for the current properties that we have. Got it. So um, we find the same thing. People are kind of ingenious and will Google us and find us directly because okay. we rent as LexBnB on the Airbnb platform. Um, and keep in mind that maybe we're getting 3,000 maybe for, or let's say, um, let me take another more um, common example. Maybe uh, I'm getting 6,000. They'll be paying 9,000. Because not only are they paying the Airbnb fee, remember they're paying 15% tax right. as well. Yeah, correct. Uh, any stay under 91 nights is taxed at 15%. Um, so it's crazy what they're paying. Uh, you know, but we make sure that anyone that's booking on Airbnb knows who we are and knows that they can book directly <clears throat> next time. Um, but, um, so I don't know, does that address your question? Yeah, so no furnished finders for anyone Oh, we we'll use that. We we'll use, use furnished well. finders. Um, depending on the property, the location, um, I use furnished finders. Sometimes I use sabbatical homes is another. Um, there is one that's specifically for students even. I'll share the name with you. Um, so we use those others more selectively. Um, I don't really, um, I don't really like Booking.com. I found that people can cancel at the last minute, mm -hmm. and that I am still stuck paying the fee. Yep. We do the if you're booking more than um, 60 days out, we have seven night minimum um, because I want those longer stays, and then I'll fill in around the seven night minimum with shorter stays. And um, there's a lot of different software. You can set that up and then it does it automatically. Um, and it depends on the size of the property and the location, where I'm putting that minimum stay and when I'll back off that. Um, so, you know, if they're, and then also, um, you know, what you do to your price, because they tell you, if you're 10 days out, drop your price. Um, and I, um, you know, talk, talking with the people that do the software, I said, People are booking now seven to 10 days out. I'm raising my price last minute. So, so keep that in mind. I raise it. If you are booking more than 90 days out, you are coming for a special event. So I raise my price. Um, if you are booking within seven to 10 days, I raise my price because that's the average um, you know, window that people are planning. So, um, so you just kind of knowing all this strategy, this pricing strategy. Um, and 
um, and using that to your advantage is important. It is amazing how late people will wait yeah. before coming to you know, yeah. the store. To oh, I'm not late. It's, 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 it's kind of crazy. Yeah, yeah. And, this, <laughs> and again, knowing that you know, as well. yeah. the larger the property, too, the further people are booking out because if it's a large house, they're coming with a lot of other people. They're planning ahead. Um, so they, they are planning in advance and booking out. Um, my one bedrooms, um, I know people are going to be arriving last minute. Um, so it's, so I won't have the same strategy, um, on, you know, on all properties, the strategy is different. Are you taking deposits or like, uh, lease agreements for bookings that are outside of Airbnb because there's no, uh, insurance or protection? Um, I'm taking a deposit. Yes. If it's, but I'm not, I'm not having them sign, um, you know, in my software, if they're booking online, they have to check the box that, you know, I've, I've read your contract and agree to it, check the box. Uh, um, so that handles that. There's some questions over here. Uh, the gentleman all the way in back. Are there any regulations for the medium term rentals right now in DC? Any regulations? Yes. Um, <coughs> no. Um, well, you need to have a, a basic business license. So you do need to be licensed, and um, and you need to collect the tax. So any stay under mm -hmm. 91 nights is taxed at 14.95 percent. So you need to be collect. I know 91 Did you nights. Say that again? Mm -hmm. Any stay um, under 91 nights is taxed by OTR at 14.95 percent. So that is really hefty. It's a sales and use tax, and so you need to be collecting that and submitting that to OTR. Um, I submit once a month, so it depends on how much how much revenue That's you're collecting. Ninety-one days or less, correct? Correct. If you're ninety-one nights, you don't. Um, mm. So of course, I mean, people are very grateful when they're looking for an, an eighty-night stay. That I say, hey, you know, you, you can add nights. eleven nights, and you'll actually save money because right. you're not going to be paying tax. So that's Thank helpful. You. So we, um, you guys touched on, it's kind of a common theme here is that um, it's always better to invest in a place that you like. So, you know, I, I know you mentioned London as, as being a possible place where, you know, when someone is not um, living in your space and you're not having someone in your space, you can be there. But you mentioned visas, um, you know, Colombia being a place where it's very easy to get a visa. What are some, what are some other countries? What are some random, like, you know, what are some countries that um, have, you know, good tourism? I mean, what are some other countries? Yeah, so, so I have a question. If you can answer this question, kind of with this question. Um, a lot of you, a few of you guys mentioned like overseas, you know. And so what's attracting you to, you know, run your business overseas versus in the States? Yeah, for me it's uh, Eternal Spring, so it's literally perfect weather year round. Um, tourism is on the upswing, it's almost recovered all the way from the pandemic. Crime is way down, so it's really, and it's on was on the Forbes list of top you know destination cities to visit. So for re, and plus the cost of living is you know the dollar goes very far there. So for a number of factors, and we're getting paid in these platform platforms in USD into our, our bank account here, and we're paying out in pesos. So it's a mm -hmm. there's definitely a arbitrage mm -hmm. margin there. Um, yeah, if you have a chunk of change and you want to park it, you know, the, the visa, that's a good way to get a visa and kind of skip the line. Um, but then you also have the, the currency risk, right? It's slipped since I've been there you know, 20, 30 percent. So it's, it's a real thing that's happening. It's not the only country it's happening to, but something to be aware of as well. Um, so it's, it's a mix of factors. As far as other countries, I can point to one, but you know, we want to be in um, Asia and Europe, so. Yeah, I was gonna say, I, mean, I, feel like, I feel like the you know, yeah. perfect scenario is someone like gets an island in the Maldives. Right. <laughs> Puts them home, you know. I mean, <coughs> I mean, can you entice Maldivian government to just give you a right. visa to do that based yeah. on the fact that you can really bring the money? Because that's tourism is, is, is all they have there. A place like that or a place, if you search Andorra. On, I don't if know. you search online, there's a couple of, I think Austria and Portugal are the two European countries that have the lowest, um, Let's go. like you buy real estate and you will get a residency for that. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah, Portugal is changing really. Huh? Portugal is changing. Portugal is changing. And you can pay taxes for 10 years. Yeah. And me, uh, I mean, there's some pretty there's some pretty interesting incentives. They're not low, but they're not exorbitant either, especially if you consider you get a residency permit to allow you to live there. I don't think you can work. But, um, you know, there's some... Normally, you would, it would be very hard to get a residency permit, but if you buy real estate in these countries, they will get you the residency. 
On the topic of choosing a market, um, for the Airbnb, what sort of numbers are you looking at, like cash on cash returns or property type or amenities, location? How are you, and I know you're, you're in DC and maybe some of your, are all your properties in, in DC or? I have some in Virginia. Okay. Yeah. How are you going about um, you know, choosing what property makes the list, whether it's cash or cash returns or another metric? Location is important, the condition of the property. Um, you know, I, I want to make sure that I can be very successful with it. Um, number one is going to be location um, and the condition and um, how appealing it is. Okay. So, um, so definitely class A. Incredibly good, like incredibly well maintained. That kind of thing. Yes, and and appealing, well, um, well, and appealingly furnished. Like I just got one where mm -hmm. the owner furnished the. Um, I guess I spoke with him six months ago, and he came back and he said, "I'm ready." And he showed me the photographs, and he had furnished the living room with three Lazy Boy recliners. <laughs> and I was like, "Why did you do that? Why didn't you talk to me?" Because the Lazy Boys are going. Um, <laughs> So how appealing it is too, and and um, you know for my clients they do bring me in a lot of them from the very beginning, which is I'm thinking of buying this house. Will you go with me to look at it and tell me what you think? Um, and I'm glad to do that and be involved all along, um, you know, kind of every step of the way, to make sure it's a good investment for them. Are you running the numbers on Air DNA, or is that something your your client does before? Um, I I'm not looking closely at air DNA and I guess just because I've been operating in DC from the beginning um, so there are neighborhoods that I say I you know when people call me I say what's the address I pull it up um, and look it on Google Maps and um, you know a, a lot of times I can determine right then you are air DNA that's where the <laughs> yeah. Yeah. From. yeah it's like mm, I, you know we're just not gonna have a demand in that neighborhood um, <coughs> That said, um, and a colleague down here touched on this, with so much of the Airbnb um, available inventory, let me say the short-term rental inventory um, disappearing um, with these regulations, those properties that are still on the market and legal and able to post on VRBO and Airbnb are really doing great. Mm -hmm. um, so we're getting you know, pretty much, um, I mean, we could have back-to-back -back rentals, I agree with my colleague that I would rather keep a higher price and not have 100% occupancy. Um, I mean, it just runs us all ragged. Um, and you increase you know, the chance that someone's gonna slip up and, and someone will arrive at a property that's, you know, maybe a housekeeper missed. Mm -hmm. um, so we are doing really well. We're able to push up the prices and we keep that upward pressure um, on the prices. And I've also found that properties that are further away from the core um, are renting well, just because there was very low inventory. Like I got a, um, a three bedroom on um, 14th Street, and I was a little skeptical thinking that's just gonna be a little, that's gonna be too far out. It's a pretty long walk to like the metro. Um, East Capitol. So. Talking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, wow. 14th and East Capitol, yeah, and I thought, wow, it's going to be. 14th and East Capitol. Lincoln Park. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so I was, I was concerned because the the metros are not that close. You're more than a mile out. Um, but it is, it's adorable, um, and we are getting like back, pretty much back to back bookings. Maybe it's. Um, well, say 75% occupancy, um, and I keep pushing up the price. I think we're now at like 600 a night, um, and then much higher for, um, you know, you need to know um, Christmas, Thanksgiving, Valentine's Day weekend, um, and other events. You need to know those in the city. And now that the convention um, center is back hosting conventions, you need to know where when those conventions are. Um, we're gonna wrap up just in a little bit. But I have an Airbnb on 14th and East Capitol. Yes! <laughs> um, how many bedrooms right. is it? Um, it's three bed to bath. Wow. So it's six grand? Right. No, 600. 600 a night. And we started, um, you know, we started to, you know, you need to get traction. A lot of people yeah, think you just throw it on Airbnb and um, the renters will come. No. 
So you mentioned lower price first, get some people in, get the reviews. They say that kind of the magic number on reviews is that once you have four, then people start to have some confidence in your product. Um, um, because, you know, I have a new property, people always, all the time say, why are there no reviews? Um, and on, like on Airbnb, I said, look, I have 3,000 on Airbnb. You can see that right at the bottom of the page, so you can have confidence, but it's a new property. Wow. And sorry, this was for the 30 day, or this is for like more of a short term? This particular house is short term. Okay, so is, so the owner's living in like one of the units or something like that? Um, no? no, they are um, military. Oh, okay. So, so they, they took a two so year. Okay, yeah. So okay, yeah. They're overseas for two years. <laughs> so I have lots of those, and gotcha. they're great. Yeah, I was going to say, yeah, there's no competition. Yeah. And I had, like, I had a, pro a house that was listed at 5,800. Um, you know, small, um, small house, very small house in Fox Hall Village. Um, and um, I had the pricing software on it, and um, a guy on government per diem um, came in, and he booked it for 8,000, um, 8,000 a month. Um, so even though my target price point, I was thinking was like 5,800, because I have a very narrow window. So you do get, um, you know, people come in and pay what, crazy prices. What sort of premium would you be looking at for a, a big weekend if you 